well. Huh. Okay. Now, the last Zoom that I did, I wore my own hat. And it was an older hat. And everybody liked it. And so I just walked through the store and I picked this one up because I was intrigued with it. I thought it was really cute and it has a nice wide brim. So yes, I can vouch for the fact that Fair Oaks has them, okay? So I think that's precious. Now, I don't want to uh, leave the gentleman out of this because I know you're wonderful gardeners also. And a lot of you have a tendency to wear caps and that's all fine and good but you're not protecting your ears that way. So we have some fantastic hats for gentlemen also. And I did notice that this one happens to be a Stetson, can you believe? It doesn't really have a Stetson price, well, a little bit, but it's wonderful. And you do need to protect those ears. The next thing I grab is a pair of gloves. I am very prejudiced here. I like fox gloves. And we fortunately just got a, a new shipment in here at the Fair Oaks location because they know how much I like these gloves. Why? Because I don't like to garden barehanded and I can feel everything with these. They're wonderful. When I'm working with something that's wet, I will put on one of those cheap um, throwaway gloves, but I use them several times. You can take them off easily. So when I'm working with something wet, I just slip those on and guess what? See how tightly they fit? So now I can still feel everything. They are washable and they last me for quite a long time. And so I have to have fox gloves. I Put into my little pail that travels around with me. Always my Felco pruners. Always my Joyce chins. They're always well worn. So those things go with me into the garden. Now, I would like to talk to you just briefly before we start talking about vegetables. Because I love to be out in the garden. I do not like mosquitoes. I do not like ticks, and I am actually allergic to two or three of the products that are in the natural things, and I've used them, and they don't seem to do much for me. I am a mosquito magnet, and so I buy the strong DEET. Yes, I do, but I do not put it on my skin. I have an old gardening hat and I spray that brim and top really well. And I, I wear long pants and long sleeves and I spray the clothing, okay, in strategic places because I don't want to be bitten by mosquitoes and I don't want the ticks. So I do use DEET. But if you don't use DEET, just be sure that the other natural products work for you. Now, we're, let's talk a little bit more about mosquitoes because this is important. This has worked for me for years. I make mosquito traps. They love to lay their eggs in water, standing water. I don't worry about my waterfall because they don't lay their eggs in moving water, but they do lay their eggs in standing water. There are mosquito bits and mosquito dunks. I use the bits most of the time because they're small, but if you have a large area, then you can use the dunks or you can break them up. I create with attractive containers, a, an area of water, it holds water, okay? And I sprinkle just a few of these bits into that container with the water in it. And when they lay their eggs, it kills their offspring. Okay, does that get rid of all the mosquitoes for me? No, it doesn't. But let me tell you something, it really lowers the numbers. And so it's worth that. And if you want to make a larger container in several places in your garden, and you want it to be attractive, 
then pick up a water plant or two and put that into that container. So you've got something fun inside of that, as well as something that is going to kill that mosquito larvae, you know. So we've kind of gone through a little bit of the basics of what I do. So let's get out into the garden. Okay, Amy. Mm -hmm. So this is, again, as we've done in the past, welcome to my garden because that when I'm working or not with my family or even with my family, I am in the garden. I spent so much time for so many years in this garden uh, doing things for the television show and, and for marketing and so forth. And so I have a lot of stuff in this garden. And a lot of that stuff is in the next picture. This is a bit of a distance from my house. It was originally 60 years ago, a large vegetable garden. When I had four children, they helped me with it. I did canning, I did all manner of things, but you know, time changes things. And the big old oak trees just got bigger. And so I dealt with a little more shade than a big tomato really likes. So I began to plant some of my favorite perennials back there and some boxwood and I planted some apple trees and espaliered them, planted some fig trees and numerous blueberries, other things that did well with probably six hours of sun. Okay, a couple of years ago, a year ago, I lost a couple of great big oaks back there. And uh, so now I have a lot of sunshine. So last year and this year, I have been, I've gone back to planting more vegetables. Now, this is an area that I really have treated as if it were a huge container. As you can see, there's pathways through here. There's a lot going on in here. And, and we're gonna look at some of the detail of that. And so I also grow a lot of things in containers back there. And I'd really started doing this before those trees went down because it sort of lifted them up to a little more light. Now I'm talking about really large containers. And yes, those really large containers cost a little bit of money, but they have lasted me for probably 10 years and they're still going strong. So I feel like they were worth that expenditure. All right, let's talk about timing just a little bit right now. We had an April that was a little trying for our warm season vegetables, but it was perfect for those that wanted to be started in late March so that they could really grow into April and be very productive right now. And so what you are looking at here are the little peas that love the cool weather. And when it gets really, really hot, they stop, they're gone. I'll take them out and then I'll put in a, another squash or another tomato um, for a later season one. But this is delightful because you can walk right up and, and eat those little peas shelling all right off the plant. And we do that, okay? So they're staked. And then I actually cut some interesting branches from one of the trees and put additional things into that, into that large uh, cage that I put around them. And they're growing into that. There's three pots of it. And, and I love to stir fry them if, if they make it to the kitchen. I, I stir fry them and they're incredible. So yes, but this is a plant that goes in in late March and grows in April, produces heavily in May. Now, bear this in mind. This is a plant that you can repeat plant in late August and get a beautiful fall crop, okay? This is a close-up of those peas and they're producing very heavily right now. And so I'm just loving that. Another thing that I had great luck with this year, again, this was in containers. Now let's talk about the difference 
in temperatures of the soil. One reason it was doubly difficult for tomatoes and peppers and basil is that the soil temperature is too cold when, when the temperatures were as low as they were in early April. It's perfect for things like broccoli, but tomatoes don't like it. But these are growing in a container. And so they took off much better and I got these beautiful heads, which I cut over a week ago. And now I'm getting side shoots from that, okay? So that's the beauty of having some containers among the areas where you also have them in the ground. Or maybe you only can use containers. Now, this is my in the ground area. And this is, uh, this is collards. And they're very tasty, being a, a very southern origin. I am very fond of all of the leafy vegetables and they're very good for you. And so I'm still harvesting all of these collards. But around all of that is mustard. And I think I have an even better picture coming up with that. So I will tell you that soon I will actually be in fact this weekend I will actually be plant pulling up the mustard which is finished and I will be planting green beans in, in the lower part you see this is the upper part of that little garden and in the lower part of that garden I will be planting green beans and then uh, to the other side of that I will be planting probably peppers you know and maybe some additional tomatoes Okay, this actually, and they're doing quite well, are cabbage, and they're going to be there for a while. However, I did something that I don't recommend you're doing unless you've got a remote place that you can put it. Years ago, I planted some mint in the corner of that garden. That was a big mistake because every now and then I have to go out there and pull up some of that mint and you can see that mint is trying to take over the cabbage so there's always something to do in a garden but um it's not that hard to do i'll just get in there and yank it out you know and uh, and i'll always have it because it, it's it, there's always a piece left you know okay now here is what i did the second week of april and I'm sure you remember that we had some close to freezing temperatures and some areas got a light frost. Okay, in these big containers, in late March, I planted lettuce seeds all on the perimeter of those large containers and I left the center open. Then the second week of April, now we're talking about containers now where the soil temperature is much better than in the ground. We had so many customers wanting those tomatoes because we would have some really warm days and then we would have a period of some really cool nights. And I knew that there was difficulty with planting these things in the cold soil. So as an experiment, I put several tomatoes and I think there were three in different containers. I put them in the center as I planned and still the lettuce is growing and I'm using it on a daily basis. But I covered that tomato. Now it's in warmer soil of the container and it's covered from those temperatures. And today, almost going into June, those plants are taller than I am and have little tomatoes on them. So I'm thrilled, but that is the only reason that that succeeded was it was an experiment and I was trying to see, was this gonna go through that, those cold temperatures and produce and it did. Okay, so that, that was fun. Okay. Another thing that I did was plant um, at that same time, spinach 
around the edges of those big containers. And I'm talking big here. I'm talking that that's 24 to 30 inch uh, diameter and, and deep. And, and yes, it does hold a lot of soil, but you know what? It's all potting soil because those tomatoes, those cucumbers, all of those things, the roots grow very deeply in that. And so into this one, I planted a cucumber and I did the same thing for the cucumber that I did for the tomato. I actually put straw all around those uh, plants and it was enough protection to get them through. And that was without, a, I've already harvested the bigger leaves off this, but that was the biggest, tastiest spinach I have ever grown. Okay. And now here is, is one that was taken probably last week. So you can see how big that tomato is. I don't know that you can actually see the fruiting on it, but I planted different kinds of lettuce. I think this is the romaine and it was the most delicious lettuce I've ever had. Okay, uh, let's let's come back to me for just a moment here, Danny, and and let's talk about those containers because a lot of a lot of my grandchildren have small spaces and they are growing herbs and vegetables in containers. And here's here's how I suggest you do it. I put a piece of a small piece of landscape fabric over the hose. There has to be good drainage. So that's the first thing I do. And then I fill those containers with within about three or four inches of the top and add to with a good potting soil, okay? And add either planto. This is all organic, but this is what I do in, in the ground and in the containers. Garden tone is wonderful. They're very similar. And then uh, tomato tone. Um, and the tomatoes I've used, the tomato tone, okay? So these are all good products, and I don't know that you have to have all three. I use plantone for a lot of stuff, okay? According to the directions. In that size pot, I put a cup, probably two cups, and I mix that thoroughly, thoroughly with the soil and do my planting. I'll fill it then to within a couple of inches of the top, and then I will do one of two things. I will either put the small pebbles, the three-eighths inch, like um, the little Seminole chips or the little river rocks, jack, uh, river jacks, right? three eighths inch, about half an inch on there. What's that going to do? It's going to make it easier for me to water because I have to water those things. I don't have a watering system. But it's also going to um, take care of some of the ease of watering these because the soil's not going to dry out quite as quickly as, as uh, if you didn't put that. Now, you can also use mulch. I am very prejudiced with the mulch. I frequently use the Virginia Fines, pine bark mulch. The shredded hardwood is great and a lot of people use it. And it's the best mulch for slopes because it grabs itself and doesn't wash. Whereas if it's on a slope, then I don't recommend the Virginia Fines because it'll wash. It doesn't lock into itself, but I, you can put a good inch on top of that. Okay, let's, and, and with, you may need to add, you watch your plants and see, are they healthy? Are they growing the way you want them to grow? You can also use, if you're doing organic, and a lot of people want organic for their um, vegetable gardens and their herb gardens. There is one application thing. After you've done this, you can add some of these little granules and they're slow release and it will release over a period of time. Or you can go back and add more of this and water it in. So that's the organic way. Certainly, certainly you can do inorganic also if you choose to do that. Um, that is personal taste, okay? Now, one other thing. I, I want to save the list till we get to the marigolds. Let's go to the next one, okay? 
Okay. Okay. Let's talk about diversity. They say, and I believe, that the more diverse your area is, the more confused the, the bugs are, uh, are the problems that you might have with your plants. And I'm a believer in that because I really have, knock on some wood, very few issues back there. And I think it's because I don't plant in long rows. I plant sections of things and I plant it among these things. So I have a lot of diversity. Because I began to plant some of the things that I enjoy so much back in that area, I have a long succession of bloom. What you're looking at here was in bloom last week and it's Dutch iris. And so I have a select few bulbs back in that area too. And they're incredible pollinators. With diversity, you get the pollinators and you get the birds too. And they get a lot of the insects that um, might be bothering your plants normally. So you're looking at allium here and you're looking at Dutch iris here, which is a, both of which are very great cut flowers. And, and then the strong leaves that you see there are actually lilies that will be coming on and starting to bloom in the next couple of weeks. Now, here again, adding to that diversity, pollinators. I have a lot of different types of salvia in that area because both there's both annual and perennial salvia and they a long bloom period with the perennial particularly. After that big first flush of bloom, you can use your little Joyce chin scissors to snip back all those blooms and it will come back into heavy bloom again. And so this is one of those perennials that you can get more than one season of bloom from. Now, again, you see foxglove there and, um, and that too, once it's finally finished, you can cut that back and often you'll get side shoots on that. But in that strawberry pot, which by the way is well-fired clay that has lasted me for many years. The, um, the, the Mexican pottery is not fired well and you can't leave it out over the winter, but this one is staged on a piece of slate, it's not sitting on the ground. And in that, I almost always plant the, the violas first and then the calendulas and the nasturtium because those are all edible. They're beautiful to decorate your salads or your various uh, food plates, but they're also edible. I'm not terribly fond of the flavor of a calendula, but I do love the taste of the nasturtium. So you'll always see those, but, but these are all intermingled with those vegetables. And, and there's more than one reason for that. But let's go on to the next one, okay? All right, marigolds. I am not terribly in tune with, though I have read uh, what likes what and what doesn't like what. Certainly that information is readily available on the net. Um, but I do know that marigolds are really, really beneficial uh, for keeping down nematodes and, and, and some other things. I love them. And, and I love a little garden art. Um, I don't do the expensive stuff, but some of the small stuff is really fun for me. I don't really have rabbits, uh, live rabbits, okay? Because the fox seemed to take care of that issue and I love the fox, okay? But come back to me again for a second, please, Danny. Here is something that I do have to use because there are several things that slugs absolutely love. And up until the last couple of weeks, we'd had a fair amount of rain. And when you have a fair amount of rain, the ground is moist, you're gonna have slugs. This is all organic and uh, won't harm anything, okay? 
they love the marigolds and can strip them overnight. And so I follow the directions here. I'm sure that the soil is moist and sprinkle lightly the, the sluggo around it. I don't use the poison kinds of things. These won't hurt the birds or hurt you. It's totally, totally organic. So that's another thing that I do. And I have a lot of hosta. And the thinner the leaf, the better those slugs like it. They don't seem to bother my hosta that are thick leaved. But I went out for a walk quickly this morning and I've got to take some sluggo out there because some of those hosta need some treatment. They are being eaten by the slugs and that's not fun. Okay, not fun to me anyway. Okay, <laughs> let's continue, Danny. Okay, I am so thrilled that I have a really good crop of figs this year. And so there are figs in this garden also. I do protect these over winter. I put uh, a cage, I use my tomato cages. Uh, Bob Warhurst uh, years ago designed a, a cage in two pieces that you could move around, which is absolutely fantastic. And I have a number of those. So I will have used it for my tomatoes and I've had them for years, they're strong. And I'll take it and put it around my figs and then fill it with straw. And so far so good, I've gotten them all through. But I'm really thrilled, I think with the additional sunlight that they're getting now, I've got this wonderful, wonderful crop of figs and I'm looking forward to that. <laughs> okay. Now here is something else that I have and that's blueberries. Blueberries are, are really very easy. Now, blueberries do like a very acidic soil. So if you're liming areas, that's not gonna work well for the blueberries. So they need to be aside a little bit and be sure you don't put any lime on those. In fact, they would love to have, I put compost on mine because that really helps, okay? Because my soil is naturally a little acidic with all the, the the oak trees and all that sort of thing but don't don't lime this plant and i've never netted this plant before i've always just let the birds enjoy it but you know they're gonna have to share this year again come back to me we sell bird netting or i have pond netting or any of that sort of thing and, and this is what I'm going to use to knit that with. I know a lot of people are also knitting because of the cicadas, okay? I, I have far too much to knit for that, so I just can't take my chances with that. But I may knit that um, blueberry. Now, it's not too bad. You have to be really careful because if this netting gets tangled up in that bush, it's not too funny, okay? All right, let's move on, Nitty and the delicious blueberries. Okay, weeding, I don't mind a few weeds. It's sort of a mindless task for me, but um, a lot of weeds, no, I, I don't have the time to do that. So I have done this for years and years and years to cut down on the, um, the weeds. I will put down several layers of newspaper, not to but four or more, be sure it overlaps. And then I will put my Virginia Fines mulch on top of that. I have also been known to use pine straw. I, I love the look of that, but that's nostalgic for me because I come from the deep south originally, okay. So newspaper down, Virginia Fines, good if covered the newspaper, that helps to hold the moisture in, but it helps keep down the weeds. And if we come back to me again, and under your elbow there, sweetie. <laughs> okay, and now let me tell you a little story about landscape fabric. I know a lot of people use landscape fabric um, to keep down weeds and mulch on top of that. I have a, a love-hate relationship with that. 
I, I did that several years ago and I left it for two or three years. Well, that doesn't work well for me. It's difficult to get up after that. But when you put this fabric down and then you mulch on top of it, in a couple of years, you're gonna have a lot of weeds in there again because those weed seeds blow in and settle into that mulch and they go right through this stuff. So here is what I do. Not everybody has a lot of newspaper these days. I, I think people who read newspapers are less, less than it used to be. Um, so here is what I do. I will cut when I do some of those little rows like I'm going to do with the green beans and then I'll plant some peppers and so forth. I'm going to measure the distance between those plantings and I'm going to cut, you can buy this in rows. I'm going to cut what fits that area and I'm going to put this down on the ground and then I'm going to put some Virginia fines or pine straw, pine needles, on top of this. When the garden is finished, particularly if I'm using the mulch, when the garden is finished, I am going to remove this, shake it, leave all of that mulch where it is, shake this off really well, fold it up and save it for next year. What's gonna happen? This won't have the chance then to let those seeds come in and settle in. And all that Virginia finds will be worked into the ground over winter by the good little guys that are in the ground. So you're constantly replenishing that soil with that. In the next spring, when I start my garden again, I will gather this stuff up, put it back out, put fresh mulch on top, and move on. So that's how I use this fabric. Okay. Okay, Danny, let's see how many we've got from here so I know how much I can talk. <laughs> this was a little overview that I wanted to share with you. I took a little broader picture. And, and this being taken a little bit later shows the mustard that's, that's gone into bloom. So it's finished now. I harvested for several weeks from that mustard. Now it's gone to seed. I have so many things that bring in the pollinators and that has been one of them. But it's time for that to go now. And as I said, I'm going to pull that up I'm going to put it in my compost pile because it's fresh greens going into the leaves and that's good. And it's not a weed. I don't put the weed seeds in there, but this is not a weed. Okay, so it's gonna be good for it. That's where this is going. And then I'm going to plant my beans. But I wanna share with you just once a fun thing. Sometimes the plants that are so meaningful to us are plants that were given to us. At the, at the back of this picture, you are seeing a huge rose. And I just wanted to share this fun thought. That rose is at least 70 years old. It belonged to our wonderful neighbors who at the time built their home across the street from us, but before we moved there, he brought that, hoe, that rose from his aunt's family in West Virginia. And when they sold out and all our area was developed and we didn't sell, we moved that rose into my garden. It has never been sprayed, never. In fact, I've done very little to it. I really, when it finishes blooming, need to get in there and thin it out, but that would be a task. But it blooms heavily. It is incredibly fragrant, but it's one of those that only blooms once and I have no idea what it is, but it's wonderful. I'm not a rosarian. 
but I have to have a few roses. They're just incredible. Okay, Danny, enough talking about that one. All right, a garden is to be enjoyed. And because there is so much going on in this garden, when my family gets together, they always take a walk through the entire garden. They want to see what is in bloom and harvest what is there too. But you know what? It is also an incredible teaching time because every day we learn something, certainly for me and I'm sure for everyone, and particularly my grandchildren that are now in that framework where they have their own little space, this is a learning curve for them. They can see what they like. They can see how Mammy's growing this and then they copy. So this is all good. Okay, you may be asking me, I have deer, I have deer. And you hear me say, I would not have a garden. I would not have hosta. I would not have a lot of stuff if I did not spray with Bobex. You cannot spray your vegetables with Bobex. So what do I do? I, desperation set in. I wanted to have all these things. And so we installed this larger, stronger deer netting and it, it's very simplistic, it's certainly not fancy. There are two or three posts within it to make it nice and strong, but most of it is actually rebar and it's attached to the rebar. And then the gate, as you can see right here, not very fancy, but it, it's a little gate made of the same fence and I untie it and open the gate and go in, okay? So that's how I have it. Now we can talk a little bit more about protecting with the netting as we go along. <coughs> One year, and this was a while back, I have a nice wide driveway and it's gravel. It's not asphalt and I love it because it's per well, rain permeates it, okay? That's great. And my daughter-in-law, uh, Debbie says, more things grow in my driveway than will grow in her flower beds. And sometimes I think that's true. So not having an area where I had enough sunshine and desperate for a place to have tomatoes and peppers and some other things, at the end of this driveway where I have a lot of space and a lot of sunshine, I, with those big containers that I'm now using in the back, I use those big containers here and you the taller ones in the back are tomatoes and my, they were productive. And I grew basil and I grew thyme and I grew all kinds of herbs and I even grew squash and peppers. It was incredibly successful, but I did have to go in and back that area with those tomato cages that I talked about that Bob War has created that are in two sections and I hooked them together and then netted some of it um, actually to keep the deer from eating it and they didn't. And we got an awful lot out of a small space there. And so you can do this if you have a small space. I want to say that I was showing you something that had a fair amount of space before. Yes, and not everybody has that much space but you can do this sort of thing in a small space. Now, this, of course, I did something on herbs and, and this is the small space, all in containers, all herbs at my back door because here again, I lost a tree there and uh, I have more sunshine. So then all that's in containers. So let's talk about small spaces now. This was a neighbor's, uh, uh, few years back, actually, those neighbors have moved on. So this isn't happening right now. What are the spaces that you can grab if you have a small space? This was the space between homes and it got a lot of sunshine. And it was probably at least four feet wide there. And so they grew tomatoes all across the back. They grew beautiful peppers and a lot of herbs. 
it was incredibly successful. Yes, you have to stake the tomatoes. And if you're growing cucumbers, and they grew cucumbers too, upright. But again, in doing it with the tomato cages, okay, the strong, strong tomato cages. Okay, the next one, please, dear. Okay. I am not going to say, go and plant your front yard with all vegetables. Number one, the HOAs would be very unhappy with me. But this was a friend, a horticultural friend who had some eating issues and, and she did plant her front yard, partly with attractive vegetables. She did not have huge tomato cages out there she did not leave them dead over the winter. It was attractive because she had a lot of flowers and a lot of herbs mixed in with her vegetables. So if you have borders uh, in your front garden where you have something that's attractive, you can indeed mix your vegetables within that border. And you can even use tomato cages. I did it in my driveway. It was extremely attractive, but I did not leave it in the fall when it looked ugly. That's when it's not pretty. I have passed by and seen that, and I would not appreciate it in my neighborhood either. Okay. All right. You know also that I am constantly, constantly saying please get your children involved. And I am very pleased that we have so many young ones coming in now with their parents and they are getting them involved and they are, hopefully we're helping to give them information that they will be successful. The one thing you don't want to do is give them a little pot and expect them to succeed because they won't. You want to start with something that they will have success with. And actually, some of these first-time gardeners, that aren't little ones, I want them to succeed too because it's, it's a very emotional thing. We have a lot of people that come into the garden center that because it makes them happy. It makes me happy. And it makes me doubly happy that these two little ones happen to be my little great granddaughters. That's little Lydia and Clara. And their mommy and daddy created a raised bed in, in the back of their little townhouse garden and they are growing herbs and vegetables in there and the little girls have been completely, completely involved. Okay, now, a little fairy came to my garden last week. And that little fairy loves to be in the garden. And her mother loves to take pictures and stage pictures. Uh, she's fantastic. She happens to be a teacher and I'm sure she's a very good one. Uh, Carlin came with her lovely gown and, and the babies, um, both babies were little nymphs in the garden. And here is Clara searching for a wild strawberry, which she did not like particularly. Now, I do suggest that you train your little ones as to things that they're not allowed to eat in the garden because not everything is edible. And, and they do bear watching. And my space is so large that this little one is never out of anybody's sight, okay? So I want to say to you, Please go out into your garden, enjoy your space, plant the things that you enjoy, but just be happy in your garden. Okay. All good, all good. <laughs> Thank you so much, Peggy. Um, well, we have a few questions that have come in on a variety of topics. So I'm going to um, just check Facebook really quick to see if anything's coming there. Um, but 
Uh, do you, we have guests, it looks like we've got about 15 minutes to do some questions. Okay. Um, so we will start. Uh, first is going back to, um, oh, and if you have anything else that you'd like to cover. Oh, I've, I've got a couple of things, but you go ahead. We'll okay. start with questions. And okay. then um yeah just tell me when you want to when you want to go on and uh discuss anything else um so the okay. first is about the mosquitoes so for the mosquito bits i was telling some people in the chat that it is it's pet safe um yeah. are there any sprays you can use on the top of the water to kill mosquitoes have you heard of no that? no no this this is it and those sprays might not be organic this is it this works uh, i have several large attractive tubs and I put just to, because it holds a lot of water and it doesn't have to, as long as it has standing water in it, that's not going to evaporate. Okay. It needs to be deep, deep enough that it won't evaporate. It needs to stay with water in it. And, and you do the bits according to the directions and it lasts for a couple of weeks. Okay. Or more. And then if you see the little wiggly larvae, you add more bits. And you'd be amazed. I went out the other day, I had forgotten to put these in one of the big containers and there were a thousand in that container. I put these bits in and by evening they were gone. No more. Yeah, so those things are great. rid of a lot of mosquitoes that way. Yeah, yeah, those things are great. Um, okay, the next question is, are the wild strawberries edible? Uh, according to Clara, they're not. <laughs> I don't eat them. Edible, no. but not tasty. <laughs> That's so funny. Um, okay, question is, so during the winter, you I know you discussed protecting your fig plants. Do you have any other plants that you that you protect in the winter? How do you do that? Do you stash any plants away in, like near the house or inside? Well, now that's a whole new program, okay? <laughs> Certainly I do that. I do bring inside certain plants, but but that that's a pretty lengthy conversation. Uh, I protect the figs because they're planted in the ground outside and they cannot be brought up to the house. Um, some people might choose to grow them in a really big container, but big containers are hard to move around too. So I do, again, by using those tall, um, tomato cages and filling it with like you buy a bale of straw, pine straw or just the regular oat straw, okay, and put that inside. Uh, generally speaking, I don't grow a lot of tropical things that I try to protect because I don't have time to do a lot of that. Um, there are a couple of other plants that I do that same thing with. But uh, when I'm trying to protect other tropicals that are not hardy in this area, I take them inside, either into the garage or into my basement with lights, okay. Thanks, Peg. Um, yeah. I know you discussed deer, but do you have any tips for keeping the squirrels away from figs specifically or any other? I know they eat tomatoes and everything. <laughs> Well, I haven't had as much trouble since I have netted this. They don't seem as inclined um, to climb over that netting because it kind of wiggles and whirls with them, you know. I haven't had as much of that. And the only other thing you could do would be to net it, you know. Um, there are repellents. And as a matter of fact, um, you can't use it. You have to be careful with those repellents because you can't use something if they don't want to eat it, you don't want to eat it either, you know, so you can't use Bobex on those things. Uh, netting it is probably the next best thing. Squirrels are aggravating. Uh, I do keep them from digging into my pots, pretty much. All my containers are topped with a half inch of that fine gravel, because what they really like to do is dig in fresh soil. And, and if, if it's gravel, they're not inclined to do that. So that's about the best I can tell you for either rabbits or squirrels. They're very aggravating. Thanks, yeah, yeah squirrels, squirrels are a tough one. Um, for the pine needles, is can you use them generally around the garden for mulch or is there any place where you recommend using a different kind of mulch? 
No, well, they're obviously more expensive. And, and so you probably want to choose where you use it. I just happen to love the look and I will use it in, in numerous places. I'd use it everywhere except my space is too big, okay? And not everything gets mulched at my house. I have so many plants growing so close together that they don't have to be mulched, okay? But here in the vegetable garden, where you're making all those changes, mulching definitely helps, okay? Yeah. Thanks, Peg. Um, is there any reason you couldn't use the color sections of a newspaper? And an they tell me that the inks are very different these days, that, that it's not a problem. But you know, I don't, I, I, for whatever reason. Uh, they say it's okay to use that, but I usually just throw those aside. It's only a few pieces anyway. So I don't normally use the colored sections. Thanks, Peg. All right, I know you have a few more things you wanna cover. So do you want yeah. me to, we can- Yeah, break, break the second. I wanna tell you about a couple of fun things. Part of gardening is doing something that's different or something that you haven't done before. And last year, Terry Hirschberger here at our info counter planted artichokes. Well, he had not grown them, I certainly haven't, and most of the people here hadn't. He planted them in our little garden section that we have here. And without a doubt, it was the most beautiful, and I should have taken a picture of it, but I, the foliage is magnificent. It's big, it's bold, and it's beautiful. And the artichokes are incredible. And they, it's just filled with artichokes. Now, none of us thought that they were gonna be hardy in this area, that it was more zone A, but they came through the winter beautifully. I personally have never cut these and cooked them, but, but I'm going to cook these and, and see what comes out of that. But if you want something that's different, we still have a few of, of these plants here at a Fair Oaks. And I noticed when I came by there this morning that they have a few uh, at Merrifield also. I did not go to Gainesville. It's fantastic. If you want to do something different, this plant is so attractive in your garden. If it never had an artichoke, it would be an addition to the garden. But look at the beauty of that. Oh my, I think I'm fascinated with that. Now, I have another thing that came in here, and I, I didn't check for this at Merrifield, okay? And I don't want anybody to be disappointed, but I know that we got a couple of flats of this in, and, and I'm afraid to touch it because this little display thing is kind of tedious here, okay? We got in for the first time this year, ginger. Ginger grows well here, and the, the edible variety, it has been very hardy for me outside. I didn't have to dig it and bring it in. And it loves moisture. It'll grow in full sun or it'll grow in part shade. So if you've got an area that, that will stay slightly moist, don't put it in an area that goes dry fast. You can get started with this. And, and grow it on and be able to grow your own ginger. And I think that's fantastic because I love ginger. Here again, I wanted to share uh, among the annuals. Again, you're trying to encourage pollinators. Number one, it's good for them, but it's good for us too. Um, zinnias are about as good as it gets to bring in particularly the butterflies. They are wonderful pollinator plants. And if you can see that it has little starts coming here, if you cut them and bring them in or cut them when they're finished just above there, then you're gonna have shoots and you can keep these going all summer long. So zinnias are fantastic. Plant a few from plants and then go ahead and put some seed in also. And that's going to give you two or also give you a different variety. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to plant some of the larger flowered ones in different colors by seed. And then I'm also going to plant a few of these that are already started because I'm impatient. 
I want it right now. Okay. And another great thing, as you saw in that one picture, are the marigolds. These are fantastic. But reminder again, you sluggo around them because, man, I can't believe that the slugs love it. And also pollinators, the fantastic, I'm afraid to move this because this might fall. This is a, a wonderful new salvia. It's called Unplugged So Blue. It's called Unplugged Salvia? Unplugged So Blue. Who would have named it that? <laughs> anyway, those are just a couple of fun items that uh, are something that is a little different that you might not have grown before. And we don't have a lot of it, but I just thought it really fun to mention it. Yeah, thanks, Peg. Um, do you know if ginger can grow in a pot? Uh, pot, I would bring it inside. Okay. Yeah, you can grow it in a pot. Keep it slightly moist. Uh, put a little soil moist in there. Got but it. You need to bring it into the garage, which would be fine to overwinter it because, you know, things don't always, if, especially if they're borderline, don't always overwinter as well in a pot as they would if they were in the ground. So if you grow the ginger in a pot, by all means, but put it in your garage. And it's okay if it goes, goes dormant, that's fine. Thanks, Peg. Um, we only have a few minutes left, so I just want to take a quick minute to let everybody know. I'm seeing some questions in here about pests or possible, possible diseases on your vegetables. Um, we can ask, Peg may know some things off the bat, but sometimes we need to see pictures of those. So feel free to hit reply to any of your confirmation emails. If you're on Facebook, you can send us a message or go to the website and fill out the contact us button. Send us a photo of the disease or the pest you're seeing, and we can look at your questions there. Um, me, that tends to be super helpful. Sally, let, let me uh, interject something here. Frequently on the uh, television show, I would teasingly say, because David Yost and I did it together, I would teasingly say, I'll take care of the beauty. <laughs> we'll take care of the beast. Yeah. Now David could take care of both, okay. But I'm not a chemical person. I am not anti-chemical. I do not work at the information counter. I never have. And so I don't identify these things. So if you have a beauty question, please ask it. If you have a pest question, call David. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Peg. You put it better definitely than I ever could have. But yes, David does specialize um, in our a lot of our tomatoes. I'm seeing some questions on tomatoes. Um, he actually does whole plant clinics on issues with tomatoes and that kind of thing. So yes, I would end up forwarding your emails to David. But um, let me tell you also, Sally, and please forgive me if I'm talking over you. Um, I, I want to be very, very fair here. Uh, all three locations have incredible people working at the plant clinics. They are very knowledgeable. At that moment, we were teasingly talking about David. But <laughs> David is not the only person that can answer these questions. I am very thrilled, particularly when I come in to our info counter here at Fair Oaks, which is where I am most of the time, Rarely, rarely can we not answer a question because there's so much diversity there and yeah. so much knowledge. And so please let me emphasize that at all three locations, yes. we have that ability, okay? Yes, yeah, definitely. And I tend to be biased when I talk because David does a lot of our email work with us, but he does work with, even by email, he works with other plants clinicians so but he tends to forward those out um yeah but we have so many good people it's really lots of knowledge at this store which is great um yeah. and we just had someone said thanks peg i also remember dr john from the plant clinic so yes. yeah yes everybody who goes into the plant clinics a lot i think has someone they know at each store so um okay it's one o'clock now um so it's about time for us to wrap up um, just a quick reminder, as we were saying, feel free to follow up whether you have a plant clinic related question or if you want to know something else, um, forward it. I'll make sure it goes to Peg, goes to David. Um, David will then forward it on to other plant clinic members as needed. Um, basically, the gist is I do marketing and event planning, so I will not be trying to answer your questions 
unless it's to send you a link if that's what you need. Um, we will be sending out a survey, a coupon, and a link to the recording of this class tomorrow if you are attending on Zoom. If you're on Facebook, go to our website, fill out that contact us tab, uh, contact us button, and we'll send it to you uh, that way. Um, Peg, do you have anything you want to close with before we wrap up? Enjoy your garden. Thank you. Thank you all, Peg. Thank you for joining us to do this class. Um, and we look forward, hopefully, to seeing you all in the store soon. Have a good afternoon.